Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of Military History Inside Out. Today, I speak with uh, Professor David Sneed, who edited a memoir, a World War II memoir of a B-24 Air Force pilot who ran missions, 28 missions over Europe. Uh, well, thank you and enjoy. I'm speaking with Professor David Sneed, author of Flying with the 15th Air Force, a B-24 pilot's missions from Italy during World War II. Thank you for speaking with me. You're more than welcome. So first, I'd like to ask, um, how did you get into uh, studying and writing about history, or actually editing? I guess the book is an, uh, you edited. Um, the, the, the book's an edited volume. Um, I've always been interested in history, Chris. It's been uh, you know, something from since I was a little child, really. So it would have been a surprise if I didn't do something with history when I grew up. So that just led me to pursue um, you know, an undergraduate degree in history and then a master's and Ph.D. in history with the goal of teaching at a university. And so that's what, you know, that's kind of where I came from. Um, in terms of editing and getting to, to this project, I never dreamed that I would be doing that. Uh, uh, I've always had an interest in World War II, but most of my research in graduate school was really on the cold, early Cold War, the Eisenhower years. So, um, but by chance, uh, I met Ron Christen, who is the editor and uh, director of the press at the University of North Texas, the May Medical Conference, and basically started a relationship with him. And at that time, I was editing another B twenty four memoir uh, from a, a pilot who lived in Midland, Texas. And so he said, "Oh, I'd love to see that. We're interested in that type of thing. We have a new series." And so from that point forward, about 15 years ago, 15 or 16 years ago at this point, um, Ron and I have collaborated on some different projects and, and, and so forth. And uh, that book ultimately is no more is ultimately published by, by North Texas. And then since then, there have been two or three others. This is the first one that's come all the way to the, the book format. But uh, Ron had seen this um in an, in an early edition of the memoir that Tom Faulkner, the pilot, wrote, first uh, uh, printed privately or, or self-published, and Ron thought this would be really good in, in his series at University of Texas. Mm. And so he contacted Tom and said, you know, we would like to, to publish this, um, and we'd like you to go through a, a kind of work with an editor because I have the perfect guy for you. And so that started it. That was about two and a half years ago, mm. I, I would say. Um, when, he, when they approached me, so that's how I got specifically involved in this one, um, and, and it's basically been along for the ride and enjoying the process of working with Tom. So, as the editor, do you simply um, sort of pick and choose uh, what should go in the book, or do you add um, commentary of any sort or footnotes? I mainly I, I did a couple of things with, with Tom's. Um, I added explanatory footnotes. That's was a big thing. Um, my goal with memoirs, because there are, there are a lot of problems with memoirs out there that they're unsubstantiated. They're, they're, they're one person's feelings and beliefs, and um, they're, they're as from a history perspective, historian's perspective, they're very worthwhile, but their reliability um, is mixed. Mm -hmm. And so, my goal is to to make them more reliable by trying to verify. Whatever in this case Tom said, can I verify? Can I? Is there documentation to show that backs up what he said? And so I set out, you know, verifying the story in any way I can. Um, then I also try to add more context, and that's where sometimes in the footnotes, and then also I'll have a, an editor's preface, which I can lay out the story um, to set the foundation for the book, and then adding extensive footnotes throughout to basically provide some context and that verification I was looking for um, to prove basically that what Tom was saying wasn't made up or that he had a faulty memory that this is really what happened. Um, and it doesn't have a whole lot of dialogue where he's remembering conversations. Um, and so those are areas you really can't prove one way or the other, but I could document exactly where he was with, um, sources, some sources from other books and documents from the National Archives, some stuff from the uh, Air Force Archives, 
So I was able to verify basically his story as we went through. Okay, so I'll ask you about the resources he used a little later in the interviews. Um, yeah. Right now, uh, let's talk about the book itself. Um, tell me about it. Um, the book, uh, it, it's it's pretty unique. Um, there are some, and there, there's more that have come out recently, but uh, Tom flew a B-24, and he flew 28 missions, uh, co- actual combat missions, and he flew with the 15th Air Force, which was stationed in Italy uh, during the war. Mm-hmm. And there's not nearly as much on the 15th Air Force as has been published on the 8th Air Force, which was based out of England and I had started sooner in the war, so uh, most people have heard of Memphis Bell, and whether by movie or books, and another, I mean, it's a famous story, but that was the 8th Air Force, and it's just got a lot more attention, whereas the, the, the 15th Air Force is almost like the stepchild, um, but it served a very active role, so just having a pilot's view from the 15th Air Force, there are a few, but not many, adds to that story. Uh, but then Tom had some fairly unique experiences. Um, he w- was possibly the youngest vi- of a U.S. bomber pilot in the war. Mm-hmm. There's no way to verify this. I've checked with the Air Force ar- archives to, to see if they had anything. There's no way to verify it. But um, he entered the Air Force uh, in like within a couple of weeks of his, his 18th birthday mm-hmm. and immediately began pilot training. Um, so by about the time he was 18 months, 18 years, 10 months, he had completed and got his own his wings. There's still further training at the B-24 level and four engine level, but, mm-hmm. and he was a lieutenant at that point. Um, they didn't speed up that process and you, you wouldn't start before 18. So if there's anybody that was younger than Tom, they somehow were in you know, like a two week window after their birthday turning 18 and, and we don't know of any. So, so he was very young and he ended up completing all his training, which took uh, a little over a year, um, almost a year and a half before he was stationed um, in Italy. So he goes to Italy and he's 19 and a half years old. So here is a uh, pilot, but also plane commander. He's, he commands a crew total of 10, including him. Mm-hmm. And so I mean, it's just incredible. Somebody at 19 would have that type of responsibility. And he completed all of his missions before he turned 20, his 28th mission, um, before he turned 20, a couple of days before he turned 20. Mm-hmm. Um, and each mission that a, a crew flew was unique in itself. But one thing that happened with Tom that was m- more unusual was on the 28th mission, uh, they were uh, flying to a target in Germany, Augsburg, and his plane was severely damaged by flak. Uh, he was having engine trouble to begin with. And then it, it was severely damaged by flak. So at one point, he only had two engines working. And to return on that flight, he would have had to fly over the Alps. And there was no way for him to make it over the Alps. So he decided to try to make a run um, for France. Mm-hmm. Basically head, at that stage, head west for France. Um, thinking he could head, which had been recently, this is February 45, so France had been liberated recently. Mm-hmm. Um, but... While doing this, he actually flew over the northern edge of Switzerland, where Switzerland and, and, and the German border meet. He flew over that edge, and while over Switzerland, Swiss fighters came, and Switzerland's neutral fighter planes came up and basically ordered him to land, which was under international law what they were supposed to do. So hmm. he ended up being forced to land in Switzerland and was interned um, for a short time, and so that actually ended not only his, but his crew's uh, tour in, in Europe, mm-hmm. because once you're an intern, you can't go back and fight um, in that, that theater. So mm-hmm. uh, thankfully for him, he was only intern for a little over a week before he was part of an exchange where Switzerland gave a certain number of German crews to Germany, um, soldiers who had been pack- captured, and some Americans to the Allies and that had been negotiated. And from there, he had to fly home. Mm-hmm. But not many uh, crews experienced that type of end to their tour, which was you know being forced to land and being interned. So mm-hmm. there are several unique features of his story um, that made him distinct from a, you know many of the other pilots, but not all. Mm-hmm. And so that was really fascinating to see. And it's a different stage of the war, um, but seeing the effects of anti-aircraft fire, uh, fire the flak on 
um, his plane and other planes was pretty incredible. And, and if, you know, I think this is a 19 year old commanding this crew. I mean, I'm, mm. I'm still, as I tell you that, I'm awed yeah. by that concept. Yeah. So does the book um, start sort of when he was a child and then into his training, or uh, where does the story begin? Um, it, it, it starts with his child, brief overview of his childhood. Um, mm-hmm. That's one of the things I encouraged him to add. That was not, there was not a lot of that in his, the original that came out of a few years ago that he self-published. Mm-hmm. Um, and how he had done the original memoir was do a lot of reminiscing, so... Kind of throughout the book, he would talk about a mission and then have a flashback to an earlier time in his life. Mm-hmm. So we reorganized it to give it a more chronological um, sense to it and develop chapters which look at his early life through his training and then obviously from there to his mission. So we have um, a chapter that goes up pretty much through up to college, and I can talk about that later if you want. Mm-hmm. And then um, his training, and then by basically the third chapter, he's entering into combat. So we focus there, and then at the conclusion, we have a, 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 a section, actually two sections, of one on his post-war life, and then kind of his reflections on his experience, especially um, one of the key kind of underlying themes through kind of his memoir was um, giving thanks to his friends and um, also to rec- recognize one particular friend from high school who enlisted at the same time as, as Tom and was called into service about a month later, but he died um, mm-hmm. uh, flying a, a P-47 yeah. uh, in, in around Thanksgiving, just a little earlier than that, in 1944. And, and, and it was somebody Tom, you know, one of Tom's best friends and, and somebody he admired greatly. And, you know, it's a re- kind of a reflection on you, you don't know for sure why some survive and some don't. So right. um, he's trying to tell that story as well as he went through. So I have a, qu- a couple of questions about the training okay. portion, which is, one, I'm curious where he trained, and two, um, just looking at, you know, there was, a, I guess, um what, what's the word I'm looking for? A reputation between the B-17 and the B-24. I guess the B-24 Flying Fortress was considered the, the hardier and better plane, and the B-17 Liberator was the more difficult one to fly. Did he Did he have a choice? It, it, it depends, actually. It's typically, and it depends on who you talk to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you, know, you, you ask a B-17 pilot, they're going to tell you it was the best plane. If you ask a B-24 pilot, they'll tell you it was the best plane. Mm-hmm. Um, the B-17 was definitely prettier, sleeker mm-hmm. in design, mm-hmm. uh, and that was the Flying Fortress and the, the B-24 Liberator, and it was also called the Flying Box Car because it had a, kind of a rectangular shape to its fuselage. Mm-hmm. Um, so it really depended on who you talk to. Um, they both served the country well. Mm-hmm. In the end, the, there are more B-24s that were built than B-17s, but we're talking, you know, between ten and twenty thousand of each were built, mm-hmm. um, and any of those pilots would tell you the B twenty nine, which flew in the Pacific and came late in the war, was far superior to anything uh, that was built. Yeah. Um, <laughs> his training, uh, he did most much of his training was in Texas early on, um, and then so you go through kind of a, a basic, and then uh, you go through a primary, what they call primary training, where you're learning if you're in the pilot. Uh, Canon School. And, I, and I, let me step back uh, for just a minute before I go into that because I think it'll set the stage a little bit more. Um, it, it was the Air Force through the war went through different requirements to go into pilot training. Um, early on, they were stricter. They became looser in the middle of the war, and, and then they got stricter to him when they didn't need as many, more pi- many pilots. Mm-hmm. And Tom and his several of his friends, uh, there's a group of them, including the, the, the one I mentioned who was killed in action. Um, they all graduated from high school in 1942. Um, so they were seniors in high school at the time of Pearl Harbor. Okay. And so, now Tom, most of them were young. They were 17, 17 when they graduated. So they weren't subject to the draft yet. Um, but they knew it was coming. And so a group of them decided upon graduation to go to college immediately. So they went to college um, at Texas A&M. Uh, Tom was from the Dallas area. Um, 
Texas A&M, and they started in the summer, and they stayed at Texas A&M, Tom, through the fall, and in the spring they decided to go to transfer to, to SMU, which was closer to home. I won't go into the reasons why. Mm-hmm. But he had, had the, there were a couple of them that, in essence, finished a one-year college by going to summer school mm-hmm. and then that first semester. So in January, is late December of 42, early January, when he enlists, he's still 17. He hasn't um, turned 18. Um, when he enlisted, he had a year of college, and that was the minimum criteria for getting into the pilot program. Uh, you had to pass some, some tests mm-hmm. still, but because they got through that one year later, it was, before it was two years, later it's only two years, but there was a short window when one year was sufficient, and he was able to, to qualify under that and then get the, the test scores he needed. So once they called him in the service right at his 18th birthday, he spent the first, basically the training was broken up into nine-week segments, and he spent uh, the first nine weeks in San Antonio, um, and then switched to another airfield near San Antonio. And then he went to Kansas where he began, um, uh, training in, um, the, with the, the transition to four engines, which would have been the B-24. Mm-hmm. He had no choice. It will be 24, B-17. That's what he's trained as. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the f- more interesting stories when he was in training, just learning to fly, one of his, one of the worries of any pilot cadet was being washed out. That is, for whatever reason, you're told that you're not good enough or you're, and they wash you out and you end up getting sent to another school. Mm-hmm. So you end up staying in as a, maybe the bombardier or navigator or, but it's not as a pilot. Mm-hmm. Okay. And his instructor, um, they were doing aerobatic loops and, and Tom would pass out. He talks about his memoir. He'd pass out and his instructor would laugh at him. But his instructor said, I will have to wash you out if you do not. If you plan on flying in a fighter plane, a, a single engine, because they do tighter acrobatics. Mm-hmm. And he said, if you, you plan on doing that, I'm going to have to wash you out. And, and he said, if you want to go on, you have to, um, ask for, um, multi-engine training. Mm-hmm. Well, most pilots going through training want to be the, you know, the, the ace fighter pilot. So he was one of the only one or two in his class, um, in training that actually requested being a multi-engine pilot, hmm. and out of his class, he was one of the only ones that got that. Um, uh, that that so he was selected for that at the, as the main pilot. Almost all of his class ended up as co-pilots because they requested fighter planes, but they ended up as co-pilots on four-engine bombers hmm. um, or transports. So it's one of those interesting stories by requesting that he thinks that was one of the reasons he got it. Huh, so he started training um, in, in Kansas. Uh, and then he had some training in Nevada to, to finish up. Nevada is where they, he did most of the training with his new crew. They trained together. Um, and then once that was completed, um, they, they actually flew uh, a new B-24 to Europe um, for their tour of duty, which was unusual. Most crews went by ship. Hmm. Um, now, they didn't get to keep it as a brand-new plane, so it smelled like a new car. Um, <laughs> it was right off the assembly line. Um, they didn't get to keep that plane. Um, once they got into Italy, it, it more likely went to a more seasoned commanding officer. Still, got the new ones. Mm-hmm. Um, but once he got to Italy, he was assigned uh, again to the 15th Air Force and the 737th um, Bomb Group mm-hmm. uh, or Squadron, excuse me, and uh, began flying missions pretty soon after he got there. So I noticed that uh, the Tuskegee Airmen um, were in in the um, the 15th. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, they're 99 Pursuit Squadron. Um, Tom did not recall any interaction with them. Mm-hmm. Um, not that they weren't. Uh, the They did not share the same airfields, okay. like fighter planes and bomber planes. And so mm-hmm. there typically was not much interaction, and he did not recall uh, the Tuskegee Airmen specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the, 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 I mean, it's very nice for Tom in terms of his experience, by the time he started flying missions, there were was very little German fighter activity or Luftwaffe mm-hmm. activity. They they had been in essence swept from the skies the previous six months, mm-hmm. and so the main threat for Tom was the anti aircraft flak. Mm-hmm. Uh, they always had a lot of fighter protection, P thirty eight and P fifty ones, and the 
Tuskegee through B-51, so they could have been providing protection. It wouldn't surprise me. Um, but in Tom's experience, the threat was not enemy fighter planes. It was the flak coming up from the ground. Mm-hmm. So does he talk about um, life there as well as the missions? You know, how does he mix yeah, that up? That, that's incorporated in. I try to make sure that we develop that as much as possible. So um, the they were based, uh, the, the facilities were very primitive um, for the, the pilots and crews. Um, they lived in um, tents. The, there were four officers on a crew typically 10 went on missions, mm-hmm. um, some variation, but the normal crew was 10, and there's four officers and six enlisted men. The four officers slept in the same tent, and then the six enlisted men slept in the same tent. Same size tent, so the, he, he said the enlisted men would have been more crowded. Mm-hmm. Um, for the most part, while they were there, they were still completing this camp, and so the, the stories, you know, he described them, and I read from others that were there, a lot of mud, Food not very good, a lot of improvising on food. Uh, Tom said he, he thinks he took, um, two showers while at, on his base, uh, for the roughly six months he was there. Uh, but he said that was pretty typical. So he said, I'm sure we all stank, um, big time, but we all smelled the same. So, you know, we didn't really notice. Um, Mm-hmm. And very, the, the, they had a cot, each one had a cot to sleep on. He said, you know, very thin, um, mattress and a thin blanket. He did not have a pillow, so he actually used his clothes as a pillow, um, mm-hmm. the whole time. The shower that was available was basically a, a hose and a pipe in the middle of the field. Mm-hmm. Um, not the, not the airfield, but a field nearby. And so they literally, if you wanted a shower, they trucked you out to the middle of the field. No curtains, no nothing. So you basically were buck naked standing under cold water. Mm-hmm. And he was there from basically September to March. Yeah. And so <laughs> we went from fairly decent temperatures to cold. And so um, the only time he said we really showered was uh, they had one week of leave to the island of Capri, and they showered there. Mm-hmm. And then well, actually when he was intern, they had a better you know, they stayed in the hotel, so they're all shower there. So, mm-hmm. but, um, it was dirty, rainy, uh, so he did, yeah, he goes, he describes that. In ways, it's kind of like a group of teenagers, which, you know, not all of them are teenagers. Tom and several on the crew were a group of teenagers hanging, teenage guys hanging out. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so there's this camaraderie, a lot of card playing, a lot of boredom in between, you know, missions. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the ultimate goal, while he was there, the the tour lasted 35 missions, so that was the goal all along, was to get to 35. Mm-hmm. That's 35, you rotate at home. But the chances were, when he was arriving, were not great for somebody finishing 35. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Just because it, it got better over the next six months, but you know, typically it was about a 25% chance you would actually finish your tour. So, um, so they set out to get that he flew a lot more missions uh basically most of his missions were completed by thanksgiving i would have to pull up the the chart of his missions but Mm -hmm. uh, that he went on leave in november um and they had flown close to 20 missions and so basically two months Mm -hmm. from mid-september to november Mm -hmm. um after that for the once he got back from december to his last mission he had eight um and part of that was Weather was horrible during that time, so it was hard to get planes in the air. Mm-hmm. There were more pilots than planes, so they didn't have to fly it. Each pilot didn't fly as frequently as previously. Mm-hmm. And um, so he did not know when he was actually, you know, his plane was damaged and he had to land in Switzerland. He wasn't sure he would finish 35 missions by April, mm-hmm. the end of April, which was the last flight. So, But that was their focus. Let's get through, um, do, our, do our job, do our mission. You know, tolerate the conditions, um, but his main memories of Italy were were kind of rain and mud. Mm-hmm. He did visit it about ten years ago. He went back, and all that's there is a field now. Um, there's no airfield or anything like that. So I know he was surrounded by um, a lot of young guys, but being such a young pilot, bomber pilot, did it uh, 
did he get extra ribbing or did it cause any kind of problems for him? He, he talked about, um, I don't remember any ribbing for that. Um, you know, during training there was ribbing, but not because of his age. It's just that, you know, the younger cadets got ribbed by the older cadets. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he thinks that was an issue with his original co-pilot. Um, they trained, uh, who was probably mid twenties. Um, and he's, they trained together as a crew in the States and he thought there might be a little resentment because, you know, here's a 19 year old, um, who's commanding the plane and mm-hmm. you have a 25 year old co-pilot. Um, the oldest man on the plane was 29. So there's actually one of the enlisted men was 10 years older than him. Mm-hmm. Um, but he said overall there were no issues in terms of respect. Um, you know, they would call, you know, each of the officers lieutenant, none of that. Now, his co-pilot had a lot of illness problems, so he was away from training some. Missed most of the missions early on in Italy. Now, ultimately, he was able, the co-pilot was able to get a plane of his own, a crew of his own, so he left. I say left. He, he was assigned, reassigned. Mm-hmm. Um, so he only flew a hand, handful of missions, and Tom always felt there was a level of maybe resentment there mm-hmm. um, for his youth. But otherwise, it didn't, you know, there are so many young guides that he did. Tom said he was amazed just how efficiently and well it worked. Yeah. Um, but you have 18, 19, 20, 21-year-olds commanding those that are younger than them and older than them. You know, they're thrust in responsibilities that nobody could have dreamed of. Yeah. And so, other than with his co-pilot, he didn't feel he. There was nothing that he said gave him a sense he was resented or fearful. Now there were times I think, and you get a little bit of it because uh, one of the things he did was every night after the mission he would keep a diary. Mm-hmm. And so we start each mission, you know, as we get to it, with his diary entry, as it was, you know, in 1944, 45, and you can see a little bit of kind of his confidence building. There was entries, and there was one in particular that was a, a hard mission that got back, but they had engine trouble, a flak damage. I think they landed with three engines, and, um, you know, Tom in the entry said, I, I, might, you know, I, I have more confidence in myself at this stage, and my guess is my crew is more confident than me mm-hmm. having gotten back safely. And so you can kind of see that, and, and that would be expected. But um, one of the other interesting things is that there was a great deal of turnover in terms of the pilots um, because of the 35 mission limit. Mm-hmm. Um, so it didn't take long before Tom was one of the more experienced pilots. So he was there about a month and had 10 missions, and he would have been one of the more experienced pilots in his squad. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was that type of turnover. So you, you didn't have much chance to, to act young mm-hmm. um, during, during the war. Yeah. So let's turn towards the resources he used. Um, so, okay. so apart from Tom's personal recollections and his b- book and, and his diary, um, what other sources did he use to support? Okay. There, there are some things that he had, like his service record. Mm-hmm. Um, he had several of his military records. They were quite useful, you know, verifying locations where he was. Identifying sometimes um, maybe a name of somebody he had forgotten. Like there were several performance reviews of um, Tom that were part of his record, and I would find out well who was the um, the, the the person doing the training who was in charge, um, and so identify names. So he had some of that. Um, there was a very important person to the story is a, a man named Dan Matthews. Uh, who, through an acquaintance of Tom, uh, a friend of Tom, had found out about Tom's story and had done some research to help Tom on Tom's 28th uh, mission. So he did a lot of working with the Air Force archives, getting stuff from the National Archives to to explain the 28th mission, which was his Tom's last mission. Mm-hmm. And so Dan graciously passed that material on to me. Then. I used um, with two major uh, archives, two major archives, mm-hmm. um, the Air Force archives, uh, which are in, in Montgomery at Maxwell Air Force Base, 
I was able to get much stuff has been um, basically digitized. And so they had a lot of records, like of every squadron. They have it on microfilm now. Um, but then they digitized the microfilm. So they sent me a couple of what I'm going to call rolls of microfilm, several thousand pages that I was able to go through. And then I also used the National Archives to um, look at for information on the 17th Air Force uh, and, and his squadron in particular. So those two archival sources were key to verify. I was able to find every mission that he flew, um, combat mission he flew, mm-hmm. and how many planes were involved overall for the day, but also from his um, unit, how many planes didn't make it to target because of mechanical issues, uh, how many uh how many planes uh, were uh, uh, damaged and had to return, any planes that were lost, uh, that type of thing. So, And then there were some published sources out there, you know, other memoirs, mm-hmm. other uh, uh, materials that people, have, you know, other pilots maybe had published or bombardiers had published, and that was helpful um, in getting some information to... And then... Uh, the internet's wonderful and Google is wonderful. Um, I was able to find out some information just doing internet searches. Like one of the things I wanted to, you know, he would mention after his co-pilot was assigned his own plane for the remainder of Tom's tour, which was most of it, mm-hmm. Tom would have a different co-pilot on almost every mission. Mm-hmm. And so he would say, Lieutenant, just like the, Lieutenant Wood flew with me as co-pilot today. And he oftentimes wouldn't have a first name. He would just have, you know, the guy's last name. Hmm. And I was able to find some records on the unit, the squadron. So I would look for, you know, try to find the first name and then try to find, and, and just about every case I was able to, so I could, you know, do exactly this was. Hmm. Um, and oftentimes would have something in his diary like Lieutenant Wood from Pennsylvania or something like that. Hmm. And so I was able to identify the people he flew with. And then, you know, what happened to them? Because one of my goals was, if possible, to, to talk to others who flew with Tom, mm-hmm. some of his crew or others that were in the 737, that type of thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I would do searches. And, and unfortunately, um, the overwhelming majority have passed away already. Mm-hmm. Um, some in the war, but most have survived the war, um, but, but passed away. You know, Tom is 93. Mm-hmm. And it's one of the youngest, uh, was one of the, if not the youngest, one of the youngest foreign pilots in the war. Right. So all of the veterans of the war, I think as you probably well know, um, that are survived, still survivors are very old. Mm-hmm. Um, they're pushing their mid nineties now. And so just trying to track down what happened to them, I was able to identify most cases, uh, when they passed away. And a lot of that was just internet doing Google searches, that helped a lot. Mm-hmm. But in terms of verifying him, his missions, getting information about morale at on base, wherever the base was in Italy or elsewhere, mm-hmm. that would come from the archival records. So I don't know if you mentioned this. I, I apologize if you did. But um, how uh, useful would um, the oral history archives, you know, I guess a lot of these veterans have been interviewed over the decades. <laughs> Is there any way to... You know, maybe track track down that information if any of these individuals might have done it. It's not easy, but yes, um, you know, you're going to have a better. It, it depends on the circumstances and situation. There are a couple. I never found anybody from his crew mm-hmm. that left an oral history. With one, well, it was one um, of the co-pilots that flew with him on a mission, actually wrote a small little memoir and, and Tom and I were able to connect with him. He connected, he emailed Tom. Um, it's amazing that a couple of nine year old plus year olds are emailing each other. <laughs> um, so that was the closest I got to somebody who flew with Tom was this one, this one guy, Conrad Leslie, mm-hmm. who flew as Tom's co-pilot on his first mission. And that was often the case that the, Tom would have a co-pilot was their first mission, and then after that, that co-pilot would move on to command their their, their, their crew. Mm-hmm. Um, and so those do exist, um, some more than others.
others is more of the 8th Air Force than the 15th Air Force. Um, very limited. Um, uh, there's, there's just not that many. Um, probably the most famous book um, on the 15th is by Stephen Ambrose. Um, and I'm trying to remember the title. Uh, I want to say it's Out of the Wild Blue, but that's not quite it, but it's close to that, mm-hmm. which looked at uh, George McGovern, who was later Senator McGovern and presidential candidate ran against uh, Nixon in 72. Mm-hmm. And McGovern and his crew flew from the same airfield as Tom, but they were in a different squadron. They were uh, on opposite sides of the airfield. Okay. And so um, that book was helpful a little bit, but they oftentimes flew different missions. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they, they exist, but it depends on how they're recorded, where they're recorded, and, and whether there's access to it. I didn't have a whole lot, a lot of luck finding additional members who knew Tom directly, mm-hmm. um, which was unfortunate, uh, but not a surprise. Like, you know, I'd hope to find somebody in this crew that was still alive, and all indications are none of them are still alive. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the last one, I think, Tom had communication with was 2011 um, or thereabouts. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it's just he was the youngest on his crew. And when you hit 93, that tells you something. Right, yeah. But oral histories are wonderful. And so I encourage, you know, to those who you share this with and the work you do, you know, if they have a relative who's still alive from the war, definitely try to interview them and try to get it recorded. Mm-hmm. Um, the Library of Congress has a veterans project that is wonderful that basically they have a, have guides to how students, how stu- I say students, I've had students do it, mm-hmm. but how people can have a, get recordings made, you know, they can make a recording of, like interviewing their grandfather or great-grandfather, in some cases grandmothers, who served in the war, mm-hmm. and then those those oral histories can be archived at the Library of Congress, so they're available mm-hmm. to anybody. Um, and so I encourage that. It's just there's not that many veterans still alive, and many veterans are still alive from they're just they're not in condition, or their mental or physical condition, right. to do interviews. Um, mm-hmm. Tom is so unique in that. Mentally, he is so much very aware of what's going on. His memory is outstanding. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, um, but I encourage folks to, to do that. I, I have students all the time that if they have, again, the, the relatives are getting very old, talk to them, try to do an interview um, so we can have that. And so they're very valuable. But oral histories are like memoirs. you got to use them carefully. Right. Um, it depends on when they were done. You know, somebody's memory is going to be stronger right after the war than 40 or 50 years later. Right. Uh, and so you have to use them carefully. But but it's one of the things I tried to do with Tom and, and any other thing I'm going to do is it is one piece of evidence that you can use maybe to help verify something, like in this case Tom wrote, Mm-hmm. And hopefully there's another piece that you can use to cooperate that. So the more cooperation, the better. Right. So what part of the research was most enjoyable? Um, getting to know Tom. I mean, almost all of the, our interaction was through email. We talked on the phone a couple of times. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, he taught me some stuff electronically that I didn't know about. So, you know, at the time, a 92-year-old saying, we can share files with this system, an uh, electronic system. And I was like, Oh, I never heard of it. And it worked <laughs> wonderfully. Uh, so that's the pleasure of this. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I enjoy, I've been blessed. Uh, I, I truly believe that for whatever reason, God has a plan for me to to be an editor right now. So mm-hmm. and I've had a chance to edit a couple of memoirs. And it's to tell their story. And, um, you know, Tom's story now will be read by many, many more people than even when he self-published it. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and so to be marketed to a larger group, and and so his stories were remembered, and he can be recognized. Uh, I, you know, I I value any veteran. Um, I just happen to work with World War II veterans mainly, mm-hmm. um, and their service needs to be recognized, and, and it's an opportunity. So the joy I get is learning the story and learning about the person and developing a relationship with that person. My, my main wish, and, 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 and I don't think it's going to happen because Tom's in Dallas, would be to be with him when the book arrived at his door for him to see for the first time. Yeah. 
Yeah. We've seen you know, galleys of it or page, page proofs of it, and we, we know what the cover is going to look like. Uh, but seeing that book for when you know first time you see it in print, it's just a wonderful experience, and mm -hmm. I'd love to see his face. So I'm, okay. I'm, we'll probably have his son or something take pictures of it, so he can pass those along to me. Um, but okay. yeah, just getting to learn about something I don't know a whole lot about. Yeah. I, I've never studied the fifteenth before, mm -hmm. and to get to tell somebody stories, I, I really consider it an honor yeah. to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, and, and it's a privilege, so I'm very thankful to Ron at North Texas for showing the confidence in me uh, to do that. What did you find in your research that was most surprising? Probably the the, the, the amount I could confirm. Hmm. Um, he, there's a lot of stuff out there, but I have worked on projects where it was more difficult to to corroborate, and I really didn't have trouble corroborating anything that Tom, any of the history, really, mm -hmm. anything that was really significant. Um, you know, there might be some family history in it that I could corroborate, but mission wise, training wise, that stuff was available, mm -hmm. and um, there aren't any holes. Uh, the first memoir I did of uh, the other um, B-24 pilot, I was able to corroborate almost all of it, enough that I was had no doubt, but he flew a couple of missions that, that there just weren't records for that I could find, and mm -hmm. I looked really hard. Um, I did not have that with Tom. Hmm. Uh, and, and so that was, uh, that's a surprise, because typically there are holes, mm -hmm. um, and you just have to kind of live with holes and try to corroborate as much else as you can. Mm -hmm. But that was not the case with Tom. Um, Frustrating-wise, I, I, we, we, I, I couldn't find anybody else who really knew Tom during the war. Mm -hmm. So there's no way, you know, I'm corroborating it with an official record, which is very important. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't, you know, the co-pilot I mentioned who left, I would love to have talked to him. Get his experience. You know, what did he think of this young eighteen-year-old, nineteen-year-old pilot? Um, others on the crew. What did they think of Tom? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what were their experiences? They, they experienced the same thing. Mm -hmm. It didn't surprise me that I didn't find it again because Tom's not explaining was the youngest. But that would have been really nice if I could have. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even their writings. You know, it's not unusual for a veteran to. to write something short, uh, maybe a dozen, a few dozen pages, to pass on to their children. Mm -hmm. And other than one, there was Conrad Leslie who flew with Tom as a co-pilot on one mission, who I was able to look at his short um, kind of memoir, which was just a few dozen pages. Mm -hmm. I could not find anything from somebody else who flew that flew alongside of Tom. Mm -hmm. either on the plane or was for sure on the same mission to Tom. And so that's, again, not surprising, but it, it, I couldn't add more of a human element that would have been nice there. Mm -hmm. You you anticipated my next question already, okay. some, which was, um, I was going to ask, is there, was there any issue that was particularly difficult to uh, research or confirm? Um, and that would, that, yeah, that would be basically um, others in his group, um, most of it, I, as I said, which was, uh, I put it under surprise, and I was able to, to find basic corroboration for every mission, but mm -hmm. getting additional information specifically on his crew, um, and their, <laughs> what they felt. I'm, I'm like, my sense is they probably got all, got along fine, again, the co-pilot with the exception, but it'd been really nice to get their perceptions, mm -hmm. to get their sense of this young guy, but, I was never able to find that, so yeah. uh, that was probably the biggest challenge. But again, it's not that surprising of a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just it's, it's the nature of doing something like this right. when so much time has passed. Was there anything you discovered that uh, emotionally moved you strongly, either positively or negatively? <sighs> not in a negative way. Um, on the positive side, I mean, it's just what these young men were able to do. Um, they, they were called to serve. 
and they served. And I teach, you know, once in, in the regular school year, I teach 18 to 22 year olds you know, throughout the school year. And to think that that same age group was is who I'm looking at in the war, it's just different. Um, the Tom at one point kind of <sighs> talks about this whole concept of the greatest generation uh, that Tom Brokaw had, had put out. Mm-hmm. And I, I do think they were a great, great generation. I think today's generation uh, is great as well. But there's this label, the greatest generation um, for the veterans of World War II. Um, and it, it, to me, it's just when you see what they were willing to do, Tom's friend who was killed, he had several that were, did not survive the war, but one in particular was a guy named Warner Marsh. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Warner, or Tom saw Warner as the person who had the, you know, in the high school and the annual, the most likely to be, to succeed would be Warner Marsh, the best looking Warner Marsh. Um, I guess reading about how Tom found out, which was just a letter from home, that Warner was missing in action and presumed dead. Mm-hmm. Uh, and seeing that, really Tom has dealt with that his entire life. Um, mm-hmm. Seeing, uh, one of the things that's in the book, and it, it runs throughout, is Tom felt tremendous guilt, in part for surviving the war, mm-hmm. but more so for having landed in Switzerland. Uh, because there was a stigma if you landed in a neutral country that you did that so you wouldn't have to fight or fly any more missions. Um, and there were a handful of those cases. But a majority, of, I mean, overwhelming 90 plus percent, it was all the, you know, the planes were damaged and, and around 1700 planes ended up landing in Switzerland during the war. Mm-hmm. From American planes. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was more from other countries. Um, in the overwhelming number of cases, it was because of damage to their plane and they whatever, flew over Switzerland Air Force land. Mm-hmm. But Tom worried about that stigma that somebody would think he was a coward wasn't willing to, to push through until the end. And he misread some comments that were made towards the end while in, still in, in Europe. And then an incident after he came home, he misread him. Um, and that led him to believe that maybe he made a mistake. It was his fault. And so he's decades worrying about really in essence whether he was a coward and whether he did all he could do. Mm-hmm. And that's where Dan Matthews, I mentioned to you earlier, found out about this and looked at Tom's 28th mission. And what Dan was able to confirm is Tom did nothing wrong. Mm-hmm. And in fact, Tom probably saved his crew's life by doing what he did, mm-hmm. um, which was trying for France, but, you know, it's not trying to go over the, the Alps because he would have never made it over them. Right. Um, but he probably saved his crew's life by doing what he did. Uh, and so that was roughly, uh, that was 2013. So I'm doing math my you know, 68 years after the war. Hmm. So almost seven decades. And up to that point, Tom had worried to the point he had health issues, had some surgeries on his throat that the doctors ultimately concluded were based on stress. Wow. And from since 2013, when Dan was able to find out, basically get the mission reports, and he, Dan was able to find um, one of the things. I, once a, a, a crew returned to base, they'd be interviewed to say, "Did you see so and so can go down? What did you see?" And so there were reports from other crews who saw the damage or heard Tom talk about the damage to his plane. Mm-hmm. Um, and so these crew reports, which Tom didn't know about. Um, confirm Tom made the right decision. Mm-hmm. And then Tom was actually, uh, was supposed to be, uh, awarded a distinguished flying cross, which typically you received for heroism or if you got finished your tour, which is again 35 missions. Mm-hmm. Um, well, Tom was actually awarded the distinguished flying cross in April of 1945, but never received it mm-hmm. until Dan found the citation where Don, where Tom was supposed to get the award. And so Dan, working with some in Dallas, was able actually to get Tom recognized with this 
using the Swine Cross. I um, had a ceremony at the uh, uh, air base in Fort Worth. Um, so it's just fascinating stories like that. But that there was real health issues for Tom as he struggled. He talks more about that. You see it throughout, but that's really the concluding chapter. Mm-hmm. He talks about kind of how Dan's efforts in writing the memoir really helped him get through the guilt and, and concern he still felt 70 years later. Yeah. A more practical effect of uh, historical research than uh, yeah, than you often. Very much so. Yeah. Very much so. That's good. Um, so what do you hope the book will do uh, in the field of World War II history, Air Force history, that sort of thing? Well, I, I don't have any profound aspirations. I hope people read it and enjoy the story that they learn some more about, especially the 15th Air Force and the experience of those men who were flying out of Italy because that story hasn't been told as much. Mm-hmm. Um, it gives Tom the recognition he, and, and his crew and you know, others he talks about, um, gives them recognition. Um, it brings and basically honor to that experience. Not that it wasn't honorable, but mm-hmm. people will now know more about it. You know, you can always dream big. I mean, I could say there's a, a movie that could come out of this, <laughs> but Memphis Bell's already been done. Mm-hmm. But yeah. <laughs> you, 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 you want as large an audience as you can get. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not to make money. Um, neither one of us will, will make much money on this. Um, but it's to, to, to share the story. Mm-hmm. And Tom has a fascinating story. And to me, basically, and, and this is what happened, but any, 17, 18 year old should read stories like this. Yeah. Because it, it's an eye opener. And I think they would, you know, it, it's history, not a lot of teenagers like history, but it's an eye opener to the responsibilities that they could have in a very short time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Tom went from worrying about making the football team to joining the military, which obviously means the risk entails. Mm hmm to training as a pilot. So two years after his senior year of of football, he's flying missions. Mm -hmm. Basically two years from the beginning of his senior year, he's flying combat missions over occupied enemy territory where somebody's trying to kill you. Right. And so if that story can get out and inspire people, uh, that would be great. Uh, Mm. That would be my best, my greatest aspiration beyond you know, given Tom the recognition that I, uh, uh, that, you know, he deserves. The story now will, I will say, last forever. It's in print. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it'll be in electronic form as well. So, yeah. um, it's, it's a story that won't be lost where, unfortunately, so many of our veterans, their stories have been lost. Yeah. When they, when they passed away, their stories went with them. And here's a story about a relatively unique experience in the war but not so unique that it's not applicable to others. So my, I hope a family will pick it up and say, oh, this is this could have been my grandpa. Yeah. This is what he did. Uh, with one of the, the first memoirs I wrote, you, know, you, you have effects you don't know, but in the first memoir I wrote, um, there was a, a part of it where my pilot friend told a story about a plane, one of his friends and his plane going down. You know, which was bothering, it bothered him, but, you know, he, he reported when it happened. Mm-hmm. And after his memoir came out, which was in, um, uh, uh, about a, a little over a decade ago, I actually got an email from a family member whose, I think it was uncle, was on the plane that my pilot described going down. Mm. And because of that description, that helped them pinpoint where the plane went down in uh, the front of the French-Belgian border. Mm-hmm. So they are actually able to find the, the, the site of the crash. And so that brought closure to that family. Yeah. And I That's never cool. anticipated that. I would not have thought. And it's just one of those, you know, small things. And so by publishing that memoir, that initial one, it obviously helped. Um, the pilot named Jim Davis helped him and preserved his story, but it actually brought information to others yeah. as well. And so 
there might be something like that in Tom's I don't know about. Um, mm-hmm. That, you know, somebody picks it up and says, oh, uh, you know, that's my grandfather he's talking about. Because Tom, more than other pilots, actually, because as lead pilot, he flew with more different co-pilots than probably anybody else. Okay. So Tom mentions that just because of how things unfolded. Mm-hmm. Um, and the co-pilot that flew with him on Tom's last mission, that was his that co-pilot's very first mission. So the only mission that, that guy flew was a long mission where the plane was damaged and they were interned. Yeah. More than likely, he didn't write a book about that. I mean, if he did, okay. I don't know anything about it. Right. So maybe, you know, some family member, you know, you know they got his family members, sees that now has more more understanding of what happened to granddad or great uncle or great granddad at this stage. Mm-hmm. Did you have any difficulties finishing or getting the book published? And if so, how did you overcome those? This has been one of the smoothest processes for getting the book published I've ever worked with. This will be the sixth book I've either edited or written. Mm-hmm. And, um, Part of that is is having worked with uh, University of North Texas Press before and with Ron Chrisman, uh, who is the director there. Uh, it, it was a very smooth pro- process. Probably the most difficult thing is that both Tom and I are reading. Um, this is a, this is actually it's finished. It's at the press. And then we start reviewing copies as they are turning it into book form, how it's going to look. You're, you're reading through it. And, and so both Tom and I have to do that. And so coordinating that's a bit of a challenge. Uh, it was, we discovered it was much better for one of us to be reading a part at a time, not both of us. Mm-hmm. And so, um, but it actually worked out well. It was like basically two sets of eyes looking for errors. Right. As we're getting through the process, and this is like typos or um, consistencies and spellings of names. That was uh, something we had to be very careful about. Mm-hmm. And so just coordinating it with somebody else, and Tom and I work very well together. Uh, but it's still not, it's easier if it's just one person in terms of going through something. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was about the only challenge with the process. Uh, there was a little urgency. Um the fact that we're basically, it's about two and a half years from the time that I was contacted that it's going to come out, to me is pretty incredible. Um, concerning I teach, uh, and I have a full, basically a full-time job and do this right. on the side. Hmm. But there was a sense of urgency because Tom's getting older. We wanted to get this done so he can enjoy it. Um, and so everything points to that. It's supposed to be out in October. We're done. Everything's com- completed now. Uh, the, I submitted the index, which was the last thing last week. We've gone through page proofs, which was the final read through, see if you've seen any, you know, error, basically typos. Uh, so now the next time we see it will be in book form. Mm-hmm. And so where it's exciting time, yeah. but there was a little more urgency in part I put on myself to try to work through to get stuff done. Um, a few more late nights type of stuff. Mm-hmm. Because I knew time wise, there was a time limit. And thankfully, Tom's health has held up very well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we've been, we are, we've been able to communicate easily. Um, that was obviously a, a little bit of a worry going through um, that uh, you know, we wanted to get it done so he could enjoy it. Right, yeah. So what's your next writing project? I, I was curious if you might do something on the fifth on the fifteenth Air Force because you've done so much research already. Well, I'll be, the answer is no, in part because there there's a relatively new book um, on the fifteenth, and I have always, well, at least for the past twenty years, have it, had an interest in the CBs from World War II, the construction mm-hmm. battalions, so the, the CBs. Mm-hmm. Uh, my wife's grandfather was a CB, and so just meeting him and, and hearing his story. So I'm in the very preliminary stages of doing a, a book on the CBs, uh, mm-hmm. which is going to start with a, uh, I'm going to do a, a paper on CBs at Normandy mm-hmm. for the 75th, 75th anniversary, which is next um, summer. So that's the project I'm working on now. It's, it's, I've had an interesting career and, and, and I've been led to different, as I said, I never thought I'd be the memoir guy, as some people call me. Hmm. But I've been blessed with that. And hmm. so 
Um, I have other projects that I thought I would have done that have been put off because of uh, memoirs, but I wouldn't change anything. Um, mm-hmm. Ultimately, I'm going to do a study of Eisenhower, uh, who was kind of my, my original focus of research, and look at his experience between World War II and his presidency, and I, I look at kind of the training of a president. Hmm. Uh, but that's still several years off before I'll start on that. Is there anywhere online, like a website or a social media presence that you have that people can, you know, follow you? Uh, the answer is no, <laughs> uh, and I should, um, but that's where I have um, probably fallen short uh, of doing that. But, uh, yeah, you can follow, you know, see my stuff on Amazon um, or any kind of publisher. Um, they have all my books, and so they're easy to access that way. Okay. Um, that's all I have. Do you have any final thoughts? No, I appreciate the, the interview, Chris. Thanks for speaking with me. This podcast has been presented by War Scholar. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to visit warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com for more great interviews and military history information. Your visits help support this podcast. One of the best ways to provide feedback for this podcast is is to rate me on iTunes. Please give me a good rating if you liked it, or feel free to give me a bad rating if you didn't. I'll use that feedback to make this a better podcast. You can also follow me on Instagram under Chris Alvarez War Scholar. That's Chris without an H, C-R-I-S. On Facebook under War Scholar. On YouTube under War Scholar 1945. And on Twitter under War Scholar. Thank you, and I hope you return to this podcast for more great military history.